But w to make it work on a broader scale, to cover up, you had to have an atmosphere where a broad segment of the government and the mob had agreed that somebody ought to kill the bastard as you know they saw it. And each segment that was involved in the cover-up had to have their own grievance against him, the president, which they did. So one, they were hearing rumors that it was going to happen. Two, an atmosphere had been created where they condoned in advance that it would happen. It was okay to kill this president. They were kind of hungry for it to happen. So you have a relatively small group of people actually plan and execute the killing and a bunch of other people standing by and just automatically saying it's in our interest to work a cover-up on it. And they had been fed some essential ingredients that would make a cover-up possible on which to build a cover-up that seems to us in retrospect to have been pretty preposterous of a lone assassin. Well, on Oswald, do you think he was a patsy or a participant? Do you think he actually shot, was one of the people that hit the president, that he was really part of a conspiracy, or was he just set up as a patsy? You're asking me a personal yeah, opinion, and best my, my best guess is that he had absolutely nothing to do with the shooting that okay. day. I think the evidence would prove that out uh, in a court of law. And this is the reasoning where people come up and say it was a coup d'etat. This right-wing shadow government faced with, you know, each one with their, each element with their grievance against Kennedy, and this bottom underlying agreement that, that he was uh, a liberal, you know, doing everything wrong from their view of the world, uh, wanting to get rid of him. They couldn't wait for an election. They wouldn't win an election anyway. So the only way they could defend their interests would be to eliminate him. Thereby, uh, at the same time, establishing very clearly to subsequent presidents and senators and congresspeople about who really controls the power in this country and what the bottom line is when you start taking positions that could damage their interests. On our previous programs about the Kennedy assassination, we've shown that the version as provided by the Warren Commission is fatally flawed. So our next two programs on alternative views, we will focus on two aspects of the Kennedy assassination, the conspiracy and the cover-up. Care to join us? The subjects for which we got the most letters and phone calls and res overall response on alternative views are the programs involving John Stockwell and the CIA and Gary Shaw regarding the Kennedy assassination. Well, hold on to your seats, folks. This is a special occasion because we have both of these gentlemen with us on alternative views. Gary Shaw, of course, is the author of Cover Up. He's been studying the Kennedy assassination for the last 25 years, and undoubtedly you've seen our two previous, or maybe three previous programs with Gary Shaw. John Stockwell, of course, was in the CIA for 13 years, got out, wrote his famous book, In Search of Enemies, and we've done, oh, I don't know, anywhere from 35 to 40 programs with John. Well, on alternative views now, we're going to look at the Kennedy assassination from the aspect of putting together, trying to put together the conspiracy to kill John Kennedy. In our previous programs, we've demolished the Warren Commission report, so we're not even going to deal with that t t today. But we're going to try to reassemble, if we can, the whole conspiracy, very complex operation, and then also look at the cover-up that took place, because that was quite an operation, too. 
There have also been a lot of books that have been written recently about the Kennedy assassination, and we're going to review those as well. So this, I, I don't want to take any more time with the introduction. I'm so excited about what we're going to be talking about. Well, Gary, let's begin with your thesis of what actually happened. Let's try to reconstruct step by step your analysis of how the assassination of John F. Kennedy took place that fateful day in Dallas. I don't know how long that's going to take us, Doug, <laughs> but we'll, we'll try. Yeah, what are the different elements in this conspiracy? Basically, the different elements uh, in the conspiracy concern the politics of that day, John Kennedy's uh, movement in certain directions that were contrary in some aspects to almost every major force in America. And so, though he was a very popular president with the majority of the people, uh, he had made an awful lot of very powerful folks mad at him. And so uh, Texas was having its problems uh, from a, the Democratic Party standpoint, and they were divided. And so the president comes to Texas on a political trip, and they plan motorcades and so forth for him to meet the people and give speeches and try to m mend those party wounds. He arrives in Dallas and is, of course, assassinated, uh, we're told, by one lone individual. Anybody was, that was there knew immediately that there were more than one gunman, mm -hmm. that there were several. In fact, we've got certain eyewitnesses that felt, felt like that uh, there was an automatic weapon being used. That's how forceful and how quickly the shots were being fired at the motorcade. So uh, what I did is exactly the opposite of what the Warren Commission uh, did not do, and that is take the evidence from that day that we had the, the physical evidence and, uh, and try to make some sense of it and go backward from the scene of the crime and establish shooters, okay. placement of the shooters, gun directions, number of shots, etc. And in doing so, uh, it was real easy to determine that there were at least four primary gunmen, two to the president's front, right front. And remember in the motorcade, the clear side of the automobile is the right and the rear. They planned it perfectly. And so there were two shooters to the right front, two shooters to the right rear. Uh, the ones in the front were more on a level with the motorcade, the two in the rear were upward and above. This limited in the, the possibility of hurting people within the limousine, wounding others, in fact, uh, to some extent. Go ahead. Uh, this was this would have required so much coordination, so much planning, that so many people would have to have been involved, uh, starting uh, um, even you know, with the route that it was taken. That's correct. Whoever uh, designed the route either had to have been involved in the conspiracy, or the p conspirators would have had to know the route sufficiently in advance to be able to plan it, and to be able to train. I, on a previous program, you said you think they probably trained with mock-ups mm -hmm. and all of this. Now, can you give us an idea of how this might have taken place? Okay, I believe it's very simple. I, I think that not necessarily did they have to have the, uh, someone to plan the motorcade route. I think they knew in advance from people that they had contact with the direction that the motorcade would take. And from that, they were able to plan the best possible site. For it. They chose this site and they practiced with it. Uh, I think they built a mock-up, they, they had their two kill zones. Okay, this is the kill zone A. I call this gunman number one and gunman number two. That's a triangulation of gunfire, very strategically located. Let's see, a point one, is that on top of on the On top of the school book depository. Oh, okay. Okay. This is the uh, final two shots that hit the president. This is in kill zone B, or the sixth set of road stripes and comes from the southwesternly sixth floor window of the school book depository and from the picket fence just above the grassy knoll to the left. That's number three and number four. It's real important for us to take another look at the Zapruder film. This is the famous Abraham Zapruder film of the Kennedy assassination. The president is now hit in the back, and then while he's behind the sign, he's hit in the throat from the front. He's now grasping at his throat and trying to talk to his wife. And the fatal head shot.
This is a blow up of that headshot. The president is hit, now he's trying to talk to his wife, and he receives the fatal headshot. The president's reaction to the headshot can be seen more clearly with these enlargements. Notice that as the president is struck by the fatal headshot, his body is driven violently backwards. And if you watch the Zapruder film, you see the president hit twice at one section of the street. He's hit again twice at a section, a second section. These just happen to coincide with the fourth set of road stripes numbering down from Houston Street on Elm to the sixth set of road stripes. Uh, that was pre-planned. They didn't have to try to follow him. Uh, when he came to that sixth set of road stripes, there's two gunmen that, that were already honed in right at that point. And uh, they didn't have to have much timing between the two because they knew where they were going to hit him. And um, they, uh, they fired. They did their job. The one thing you don't want to do if you're going to kill the President of the United States or any leader is miss. And I think they had two teams, two shooters, shooting teams, and they very accurately did their job that day. How far ahead would an elaborate assassination like this have to have been planned and have the people contacted to do it and trained so that they would be able to do such an incredibly perfect job uh, when, they, when the time came? Uh, this is going to lead us into a slightly different related subject. Um, inside the CIA, you don't have a class on assassinations in training. <laughs> you don't rehearse assassinations. In fact, they work very hard to convince you that the CIA doesn't do assassinations. And then later on in your career, as it happened with me, you begin to learn that they do. Uh, but there is no book in the CIA or SOP or file or office that teaches assassinations. They would lose the magic of the CIA if there were, which is the plausible deniability of having so many employees who are slightly naive, good soldiers, who believe it's a clean organization. And then you compartment out things like the assassination and like the drug experimentation program and the disease uh, experimentation program. Uh, from my military background, putting it in terms of an ambush, See, that puts, which I think it was, they planned it, they executed it like a military ambush. And this is what leads uh, me to the conclusion, and I think other researchers, in the direction of the, the shooting itself, having been planned, rehearsed, and executed uh, by principally the OP Mungu CI group in Florida that was training for raids into Cuba. They had the training facilities, uh, they had the expertise, they had combat experience in Cuba. And it, it, it doesn't ring to me like a mob hit. No, uh, no. The, the execution of it was military. Uh, and then taking it from, from that, looking at it as a military ambush, uh, you could do it very quickly. You could do it in a couple of three weeks and do a good job of it if you have pros, seasoned pros. It seems to me, reading uh, the books and the history of what happened, they were probably working on the ambush itself for perhaps four months. They probably were mapping out where they were going to do it and setting up the mock-ups during the summer. That would be my guess. Okay, so that was just a part of the conspiracy. We have the Oswald factor and the uh, fake Oswald or the other Oswalds, how many ever Oswalds there were. Now, some people believe that uh, Oswald was part of the conspiracy. People, some people say he wasn't. Some people say he actually fired a shot. Some say he didn't. But whether he did or not, the name and person Oswald or people Oswald was involved in a very careful planning, it looked to me, because we had Oswald showing up in Mexico City. We had Oswald here, uh, a man named Oswald. Um, going from Miami to Dallas in a caravan carrying uh, uh, rifles. Um, you mentioned in a previous program that a, uh, uh, an international, I think it was Swetra, an international killer who also used the name of Oswald. Well, no, it was uh, a fellow from Texas, a young man from Texas that uh, okay. used the name Oswald in his gun running operations. Okay, to, that's to right. Cuban okay. Exiles, uh -huh. So there would have had to have been this planning ahead of time also either to have 
Oswald as the patsy or to have all these other uh, various th ways to set up to uh, try to make somebody uh, the patsy. So what is your feeling on this aspect of a conspiracy? I think naturally um, in the, in the pre-planning of this thing, they had to have something that would throw the authorities off there in Dallas immediately. And uh, Oswald became convenient because of his background as having been uh, communist aligned. He went to Russia and renounced his citizenship and so forth, and he was a perfect one because, uh, let's face it, in the United States and in Texas, we're ready to hate uh, a little commie any day of the week, uh, you know. And so when they were able to pick up Oswald, and he had good background. He had already been working with uh, uh, the Cuban exiles, we found out. Uh, he was also working as a pro-Castroite and passing out uh, fair play for Cuba. Uh, leaflets, etc. So he would seem like a cover up itself. That's right. right. He's it's, doing all of the staged. right things, yeah. and uh, his trip to Mexico is a mystery. It's still a mystery after 25 years, and uh, we still don't know what he was doing. We do know this. Again, the CIA, John, plays a, a particular role in this that I still don't understand. And that is that they had cameras monitoring the Cuban embassy and the Russian embassy 24 hours a day. Front and back doors, I in understand. Mexico City. In Mexico City. And uh, yet, they were never able to produce photographs, and this was film work, you know. They, they produced photographs of other individuals, and even a man who identified himself as Lee Henry Oswald, but never were they able to produce a photograph when asked about it, they said the camera happened to be broken the three <laughs> days that he was there, you know. So uh, I, I don't know what to make of that. I do feel like if the, if the real Oswald had done what the Warren Commission and the CIA and the FBI, uh, FBI said that he did in Mexico City, that they would have had photographs and they would have pasted them on uh, the front of every newspaper in the world. And uh, because he was going down there again, wanting to go to Cuba, get a visa to go to Cuba so that he could go back to the USSR. But don't many people think that that was the other Oswald that went to Mexico City? That that was a, a dupe or a double? Again, you've got conflict. You've mm -hmm. got you've got his signature on hotel records that that handwriting experts say are his. Mm -hmm. You've got eyewitnesses saying that uh, the man that identified himself as Oswald. Uh, was not the man they saw, they saw shoot Jack Ruby on uh, television and whose picture appeared in the newspapers. So you've got, uh, again, those conflicts that uh, have never been reconciled, and we've not done it yet. Uh, I assume, well, is it possible that the, F uh, the CIA, or even maybe the FBI, but the CIA has people who are so good at copying that they can sign somebody's name and it'll look exactly like, oh, yes. I'm sure they must have. <laughs> So oh, yes. to have a receipt with Oswald's uh, uh, name on it could fool an expert if somebody wanted well, to do Well, one that, right? possible scenario is that they sent Oswald down to Mexico City without him knowing what he was doing. They had some mm -hmm. operation he thought he was part of to get him in the hotels and have him That's witnessed true. in the scene. Then they have their other person go in pretending to be Oswald in the embassy, and they don't uh, have any photographs. You know, conveniently, no, the cameras were broken that day, and so there's nothing uh, to disprove that it was Oswald who went into the embassy. Uh, what uh, what they came up with, though, that seemed to contradict it pretty flatly, was the testimony of the Cuban consul and the the people in the office who said, you know, as a the guy was three inches taller and totally different build and appearance. Now, that's one possible scenario. Again, we can't uh, we can't prove it. Uh, the way I see this thing working, trying to make it uh, understandable to me as I knew the agency and the people in the halls who uh, people like myself and Ralph McGeehee, for example, would, Phil Litchke, would never, you know, have remained in an organization that killed a president. I mean, we were, we were patriotic, you know, and we were supporting the system and the president was the commander in chief. And yet the organization clearly was involved. So you think of it in terms of compartmentation. 
you have this group down in Florida, which is not inside the building, bureaucrats, you know, wearing coats and ties and shuffling papers. Uh, pretty wild people, a lot of them Cuban exiles, and passionately involved, taking chances with their lives, uh, going into Cuba, uh, killing people, and blending smoothly into the mob activities into Cuba. And if they were the ones that did it, as appears to be the case, uh, they were quite compartmented from the activities in the building and all the rest of us. Then you start saying, well, how broad was the conspiracy? And I suggest that it could have worked this way. It wouldn't take that many people to actually plan and execute the killing, including uh, setting up Oswald as a, as a decoy, as a patsy, for the simple reason if you take a total of 10 to 12 people there at the time of the ambush, uh, Jack Ruby undoubtedly involved in running errands, working with them, and maybe a couple of other people in New Orleans and Houston, uh, directed by the OP Mongoose connections from Florida, and you could do everything, you know, that I see having been done. You do have to have some kind of cooperation from the Secret Service to, to detour the presidential convoy. This might have been full complicity by the Secret Service, or it might have been someone uh, led into it and a, and a gross lack of discipline, uh, which we've seen the Secret Service manifest uh, many times uh, before in the past. But w to make it work on a broader scale to cover up, you had to have an atmosphere where a broad segment of the government and the mob had agreed that somebody ought to kill the bastard as you know they saw it and each segment that was involved in the cover-up had to have their own grievance against them the president which they did so one they were hearing rumors that it was going to happen Two, an atmosphere had been created where they condoned in advance that it would happen it was okay to kill this president they were kind of hungry for it to happen so you have a relatively small group of people actually plan and execute the killing and a bunch of other people standing by and just automatically saying it's in our interest to work a cover-up on it. And they had been fed some essential ingredients that would make a cover-up possible on which to build a cover-up that seems to us in retrospect to have been pretty preposterous of a lone assassin. Mm -hmm. Very small police force with limited resources would in a serious investigation would have immediately have turned up a hundred things that were not consistent with a lone assassin. But just by throwing out the lone assassin, they were able to seize on that and build on that rather flagrantly, but successfully, to sell it to the public in such a way and, and the establish the rest of the establishment so that no one was ever punished. But John, that sounds a lot like the book a Betrayal by Robert Morrow in which he tries to reconstruct uh, as best he could. And he said that it was done with a renegade group of CIA people in conjunction with the Cuban exiles, but with the knowledge of the CIA up at the top who let it happen. It was done by these people, but someone up at the top had to know. But see, that doesn't mean the whole building or all 15,000 people had to know, but there had to be a thread going up to the top, and I've speculated a lot. You know, who? Who was the chain of command? How high does it go? Uh, a lot of things seem to indicate that Dick Helms probably uh, knew of it uh, and may have been involved in the prior approvals and planning. Or he may have been sitting there knowing, sensing that it was going on, but in the sense, you do a lot of things in the CIA without spelling it out to headquarters. They teach you to do that, what you don't put in writing. And the whole science of being a chief of station is to know what they want done and to make it happen, but without forcing them to say yes or no. And, of course, where it gets tricky is if you misread them and do something they don't want done, you can wreck your whole career. So that's the subtlety of that business. So you could have these people in Florida are planning this thing, Helms knowing that it was going to happen, but no one having put him, you know, on, on the, the spot where he would have to say yes or no or sign something. And then it happens. He clearly participated in the cover-up. Mm -hmm. How high was Helms at that? Was he director at that time in the Deputy CIA? Deputy director. Deputy director. Deputy director. In our previous programs, you indicated that you thought there were some foreign professional assassins, particularly Frenchmen, involved in this, or a Frenchman. Now, that they brought in to do the job, and then they got him out the next day. Mm -hmm. Now, is this, how does this coincide with, with John's thesis that it was the Cuban exiles and their operation there? Yeah. Among this 
conglomerate, this group of people that were participating and being trained by the CIA were mercenaries or soldiers of fortune from, from the corners of the world. Oh. And it was not unusual to find Frenchmen, Belgians, uh, mercenaries, and so forth. And so it would not surprise me if you're going to kill the most important man in the world at that time, and I see him as that, uh, I think you would get the best trained men available. And it does not surprise me that the evidence leads toward some French mercenaries being, being used in this operation. Um, I, I, I don't have any great problem with that, but I don't think that they ne necessarily had to have brought in a full team of shooters from Marseille. Uh, for the simple reason they had some very passionate people right on their own staffs. I could visualize a scene uh, where some of the people like Orlando Bosch was saying, I want to shoot, you know, I want one of the rifles, and maybe some of the others, but they might have had a professional or two brought in, you know, as the nucleus of the thing. Is there a mafia connection that's plausible to the two of you? It is to me, uh, simply because the mob was already operating within this, uh, this program. The Operation the Mongoose, Mongoose to the Operation Mongoose, and, and they had taken two of uh, your higher-ranking Mafia figures, Johnny Roselli and Sam Giancana. The Kennedys had gone after them. That's right. Uh, the mob's, one of its big bases of operations was in Havana before the revolution, and Fidel was cutting all that off, severing the ties of nationalizing the gambling casinos that had belonged to Traficante and other uh, mob figures. And so in the war, the efforts to kill Fidel had been begun by the mob before the CIA approached the mob and said, let's kill uh, Castro, for example. The mob operations and activities into Cuba were extensive, and this put them uh, shoulder to shoulder and piggybacking upon and working with the CIA's mongoose people into Cuba to, to some points where they, you know, it's almost indistinguishable, uh, you know, as to what, where does CI activity stop and mob activity start vis-a-vis -vis the operations from Florida into Cuba. One example, it's not crystal clear, but it does make a point, is this David Ferry, the pilot, uh, who was clearly at times flying arms for the CIA, uh, also uh, allegedly flew Marcelo back from Guatemala, where Bobby Kennedy had had him thrown out of the country and he flew back in and apparently now the question is was Ferry on the mob payroll when he flew Marcelo back in or did the CIA <laughs> send him to get Marcelo and bring him back in but you take it another step of course the famous Jack Ruby whose whose ties are so extensive this may have nothing to do with anything but in 1947 congressman Richard Nixon intervened when the Congress was investigating Jack Rubenstein in Chicago mm. and got him off from, from being investigated and he relocated to, to Dallas and became Jack Ruby. Nixon had extensive close uh, relationships with the Mafia. So close that I, according to the Playboy history of organized crime, the Secret Service had to say, hey, Richard, you better cool it. You can't keep going out on uh, yachts with these guys. They're mafia. The yeah. people are going to start looking at this. Clearly a, a liability in his presidency. Uh, getting into the detail, and there's several of these, these books that, are, that are, are out now where you can read uh, Contract on America particularly and some of the others about the mob activities in Dallas and how extensive they were. And bringing back to what we were talking about before, the setup, luring the president into the ambush, was the Secret Service involved? Uh, to my knowledge, we don't know, but we do know the Secret Service people out boozing it up until five in the morning, one of them, uh, in a nightclub that was owned by a friend of Jack Ruby's. The close, night before close, the assassination? Yes. Close friend. A close friend of Jack Ruby's, a place where Jack Ruby uh, ran... Uh, uh, you know, visited and hung out. Same girls worked there. Same girls mm -hmm. worked there. And they were there, some of them, until 2 or 3 in the morning and one until 5 in the morning. And this was the President's Secret Service. Now, again, it could just be a very, very dirty, sloppy Secret Service operation. And they're hung over. And that might explain alone some of their a very dubious, unprofessional conduct during the shooting. You know, basic rule, when the bullets start flying, you mash down on the accelerator and get out of there. And instead, the driver stopped and turned around and looked back for a while for some very precious seconds. Uh, that could just be people with, with heavy hangovers. 
or it could be some corruption from the mob. Or maybe the mob's role was just take these people out and show them a good time and get them thoroughly drunk. Provide information also to Indeed. the um, CIA or whoever the hitmen were. So you well, don't think the mob were part of the hit squad? In other words, it has more of a military CIA operation. Oh, I think they overlapped right into it. I see. Yeah, I think, I think that the lines distinguishing from the mongoose people mm -hmm. and their activities and the mob activities in, in Florida, in New Orleans, uh, and Dallas through Ruby were probably indistinguishable. Ferry working for both, Jack Ruby working for both, indistinguishable. And you get into the question about how would they know what the route, exact route was. Well, you know, if, 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 the, if they're boozing it up until 5 in the morning with Secret Service people, you can presume that the contact was very in intimate and they knew a lot about what was happening. There's always been something that has um, not bothered me, but did uh, puzzle me a bit. How far ahead of time did Oswald take that uh, job at the school book depository? Hmm. About a month. It was about a month, a little over a month. About a month. So mm -hmm. if he was part of the conspiracy, they would have had to know what the route was a month ahead of time, would they not, if they were going to plant him as the patsy? And I wonder even if the... If the uh, a trip was scheduled that far in advance. Yes, the trip was planned that far in advance, and uh, probably the motorcade uh, was on paper. And uh, the the one key ingredient there to uh, to knowing about the motorcade is Jack Ruby's close uh, relationship with the Dallas Police Department. Uh, he went as he pleased among them. They, they came to his club. And they were treated royally. Uh, his girls were told to wine, dine, whatever they needed, and uh, to take care of them. Uh, that's the reason he was able on Friday night. We even have one witness now, a policeman whose office was right next door to where they were interrogating Oswald, who said that Jack Ruby on Friday night actually went into the office of Will Fritz where they were interrogating Oswald. Well. We know he was at the police. We've got film of him. Uh, but that has never come out, and this is a reliable officer of that day who's now retired and says, I don't care, this needs to be known. The route then, was that uh, selected by the local police or the Secret Service, or selected by the local police and then approved by the Secret Service? Because it was against uh, yes. all regulations. Basically, the record is this, that uh, the Secret Service were taken by Assistant Chief uh, Charles Batchelor at the time, who was in charge of the motorcade. Uh, when Batchelor got to Dealey Plaza after driving the, the first part of the motorcade, and he said, Then we hit Stimmons Freeway right up here, and it's right out to Market Hall. He did not tell the Secret Service that there would be a right hand turn going down Houston. 90 degree right hand turn and then that 120 degree angle turn down on Elm Street. He did not take them that far. So uh, you can speculate either that was, we don't want to know, don't tell us anything, or they were not told anything and they assumed that they would continue right on directly in Main Street and that Main Street, the street uh, tied into Stimmons Freeway. And once again, you could either say this is part of the conspiracy or this was part of the people who are incredibly incompetent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you find this all the way through. So that, all the way through. <laughs> which leads me to ask a question about the FBI then. There seemed to be complicity with the FBI, um, particularly in the cover-up, but now as the conspiracy, uh, there were people flashing badges, Secret Service badges, FBI badges here and there. Maybe they were fake, maybe they weren't. But what was then the extent of the FBI relationships? Uh, I've uh, heard uh, uh, people say that Oswald had relationships with the FBI and uh, Ruby, of course, had relationships There was with the an FBI. early report that Oswald had uh, an informant status with the FBI. They had a, an informant number that he re received funds monthly. One of the Western Union people t uh, testified to that fact, and uh, that he received $200 a month. And his uh, informant number was like S-172. Uh, in other words, they get real specific. Now, what I have a tendency to believe is that probably another individual was this informant who was using the name Oswald. Uh -huh. and was working for the FBI, and so they could legitimately say 
Lee Harvey Oswald, the man who shot the president, was never an informant of ours. But this other man who was being used, and, and I think all of the evidence points to some type of either uh, bureau involvement or intelligence involvement, even if it's a low echelon involvement, of Lee Harvey Oswald. Every, I mean, it's like uh, Senator Schweiker said, the, the fingerprints of intelligence are on every move that he made back in that period of time. FBI or CIA? Or One or the other. Or, in, in or Defense Intelligence Agency. Or we had defense, a number of them. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, so uh, that's kind of the way I have approached it. It does not have to be. And the FBI had already destroyed a note, you know, that uh, the Oswald had brought up there. Uh, well, on Oswald, do you think he was a patsy or a participant? My yes. best guess is that he had absolutely nothing to do with the shooting that okay. day. I think the evidence would prove that out uh, in a court of law. Uh, that there was somebody in his place who looked very much like him, and it's even a good possibility that Oswald, acting on behalf of one of these agencies, had actually knew about the plot and perhaps had even tried to report it. Mark Lane gave a speech in which he said that when Oswald was informed that Kennedy had been shot, he said, so, and they were accusing him of doing it, he said, so I'm the patsy. Right. Now, which would lead me to believe that he was part of the conspiracy. He may not have fired, he may not have been at the school book depository and all, but uh, it, it leads you to think that he was part of the conspiracy. Or but part of something. John Davis wrote a, wrote a book called Mafia Kingfish. It'll be out in paperback in, in November, and I urge uh, uh, your viewers to, to buy it. But it, it does uh, make a very good case for Carlos Marcello as the, the force as one of the forces behind the assassination of the president. But he uncovered evidence that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald actually worked for the Marcello family in New Orleans. As a boy, as supposedly. A boy. Uh -huh, as a runner. And and his, his uncle did work for Marcello. Right. They know yeah. that, and he worked for his, for his uncle. And so that's a close tie with New Orleans and with David Ferry and with uh, uh, you know, organized crime. And uh, when it came time to to find somebody as this Patsy, he was a natural, which leads me to the conclusion that whoever his immediate superior, his case officer, or whoever it might be that, that directed his activities in whatever intelligence operation that he was in had to have also probably been in on the conspiracy to kill the president. And he was manipulating Lee Harvey Oswald into the position mm -hmm that he was. The job at the Texas School Book Depository, uh, his trip back to his rooming house where the Dallas police car while he's inside comes up and honks twice and he comes out and the last time the landlady sees him he's standing on the corner waiting on a bus and then the next thing you know uh, Tippett is killed and Oswald is way over here and the, the timing is impossible for him to have done all of these mm -hmm. things but he ends up in the theater with a gun, you know, and is arrested. The, the first two things the cops say to him, now here is a man miles from the scene of a crime. They have, have absolutely no indication that he's done anything other than allegedly sneak into a theater without paying. And they arrested him and they're saying, shoot the president, will you? And we have eyewitnesses, near witnesses testifying to that. That's what they were saying. Yeah. And even to the point of taking a gun butt and striking him with it. And right. at that point, they didn't have any of the reconstructions of the Warren Commission, which Absolutely turned out to be not. stretched and false. And so they had to have been all set up with the stories that Oswald was the person to go after and that he had killed the president and all that. And well, so, now, were these people part of the conspiracy, or did somebody tip them off on the scene and say, okay, this there guy... There he is. Get him. Uh -huh. right. Well, I think, you know, this is speculation and can be discounted as such. Mm -hmm. But Oswald, when he saw what came down, immediately would do what I would do, or John would do, and he calls his superior and says, hey, this has happened, what's going on? And he says, I don't know, meet me at the Texas Theater, like we usually do, mm -hmm. or meet me at the Marseille uh, Zoo, uh, whatever they decide is a meeting place. 
And uh, then they hang up. He picks up the phone. He calls the authorities. Uh, your man will be such and such place, such and such time. There is another aspect of the conspiracy which uh, either would have needed to be taken care of or as part of the cover-up, which we'll get into later, and that's the medical aspect. There were medical people all along the line, and there's one whole book written about it, that uh, destroyed evidence, tampered with evidence, uh, messed around with evidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, so how did they, was this part of the conspiracy too, that people had to have their uh, counterparts or people working with them in the medical flow of this from Dallas on up through Washington? I think there's no doubt that, uh, that there had to be, and uh, I think it had to come basically from, uh, from within uh, the, the White House. The one man who was key to all of this was uh, Admiral George Berkeley the president's chief physician. He was with the president at Parkland Hospital. He was with him on Air Force One. Uh, he was with him at the, at the autopsy, and he ordered the uh, autopsy surgeons at that, uh, at that point not to do certain things, very valuable things, like not to probe the back wound so that they could determine its track and therefore the direction and, uh, and angle of the of the shot not to probe the throat wound certain things had been done to the president's body uh, henry hurt and this has gone uh, missed by by most people henry hurt called dr berkeley and dr berkeley said yes there was a conspiracy this wow. was this was in 1975 and mm -hmm. he he indicated that he would be willing to talk uh, to Mr. Hurt. When Mr. Hurt got back to him, he was very angry, very adamant, and said, I will not talk, forget I ever said anything. Wow. And uh, that is in his book, though, that, and he has got it on recording. His original statement is, yes, that there was a conspiracy. And it would have had to start right at Parkland Hospital, because that's Correct. where the magic bullet, the pristine bullet, that did all the damage, but came out with a, without a trace or a mark on it, that was found on a stretcher. So it had to have been, the medical aspect should have, would have had to start there as far as the cover-up goes. Well, it was a military-controlled uh, operation completely. And uh, I think you've got to ask yourself the question, if, uh, you know, if this happened, uh, how would uh, Robert Kennedy fit into this? Why would, why would he keep his mouth shut, uh, et cetera? And uh, we learned probably about six or seven years ago that to one of the first people that, that Robert Kennedy called was where one of the very top Cuban exile leaders, a fellow by the name of Harry Reese Williams. That's Harry, R-I-R-U-I-Z, I believe. Reese. Uh -huh. uh, Williams. And uh, he told him that, hey, one of your guys uh, killed the president. And uh, that's not a pro-Castroite. That's an anti-Castroite. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, well, why didn't Robert do something about it? I think immediately they realized that the same group went to Dallas that they were sending to Cuba. And uh, when they realized that and realized that those tracks would come right back to them, they had, they had to say, stop. We've got to cut this off now. And uh, they did do that. Now let's clarify that they, they in that case being they in that case Robert being Kennedy? Robert Kennedy, yeah. the uh, uh, people in uh, in the White House, Dr. Berkeley, orders directly to Dr. Berkeley. I think uh, J. Edgar Hoover and, and, uh, and uh, the Central Intelligence Agency had already seen what would happen if uh, if it, and so they they chose the lone assassin. The cover-up had to have begun before the assassination. Setting up Oswald as a patsy was prior mm -hmm. planning, and that, that pristine bullet in the hospital, the bullet had to have been prepared, and someone had it there to drop it on site. Hoover apparently began to give orders the same day, you know, that they should focus on the lone assassin and, you know, prove he did it. So he was clearly poised to, to react in a certain way. He didn't have to take a couple of days to think about which way it was going to fall and take, you know, an expedient solution. He had a, a position on it uh, beginning immediately. Yeah, 
Now, Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, uh, his position, it's, you know, he was disempowered in the moment the bullets started flying in Dallas to all practical purposes. His power was his brother, the president. His brother is killed. Johnson is the president. Bobby Kennedy lost his power base at that point. It seems to me he was obviously very bright, and he'd been priding himself in playing hardball for a long time. He obviously knew the risks of this vendetta he was waging against organized crime. He must have thought about his own vulnerability uh, and his brother's. And it seems to me he immediately began, okay, get my head down and emerge eventually as president, and then I'll resume the fight with some muscle to make it happen. And this is the only way I can explain why he was so relatively quiet about what had happened. He knew he could be knocked off unless he became president and had the power to do something about it. The whole Kennedy family, including uh, John Kennedy's immediate family, bought the lone assassin thing. Well, no. they it publicly they did. Yeah, I, I really wonder if yeah. Robert yeah. did. I doubt it. I doubt it. You could not be an intelligent person and buy into that thing as it as it unfolded. No, well, I mean, but this is yeah. part of the cover up too. To, yeah. You know, put this face before the American people. Yeah. But before we get <laughs> into the cover up, I'm not sure we're going to have time to get into that. Maybe we'll have to wait till the next program for this. But getting back to this conspiracy, we're talking ab about an enormous, well planned conspiracy with people in the Secret Service, perhaps, in the medical uh, arenas, local police, the mob, the CIA, and the FBI. How was it possible, or maybe I'm just naive, how was it possible to conceive of and or to organize and coordinate such an enormous conspiracy which required so much coordination and good timing and security. I don't see it as having been a secure operation at all. There were leaks from top to bottom and sideways and all over the place. Uh, I think they, they used the sledgehammer approach to the thing. One, what made the cover-up work was this broad consensus by a huge and powerful segment of the government and the establishment that it would be okay to kill the president. So a team of people did it. Others knew it was going to happen. You know, a group went out and and did it. Who exactly up high ordered them to or just knew it was going to happen, uh, one can only speculate. But they started killing, assass uh, killing potential witnesses uh, very quickly, whistleblowers, uh, people who had different uh, contradictory uh, bits and pieces of the thing, very quickly. And the word gets out pretty fast if you're in a situation like that and witnesses are dying. Eventually, according to the High Treason book, they count 49 people that they name who were involved in one way or another who died violent or mysterious deaths. And then they allude to seven more here and seven more there. So a lot of people dying and the military putting its, for example, in the medical establishment, the autopsy, all of this done in, in military facilities, the military putting the word down that anyone who broke ranks and spoke out would be uh, courts-martialed. And then you have a, a certain complicity from the press. Lots of stuff published about it, but essentially the press eventually went along with the cover-up and began to feed and play and support the lone assassin theory. So it wasn't secure at all. There were people all over the place talking about it, but the establishment decided they were going to buy the cover-up and cooperate with it and kill people who, who could have blown it wide open. The Warren Commission, of course, was flagrant and heavy-handed, but in effect successful its selection of witnesses, for example, as it, as it reworked the evidence around the autopsy and the body, uh, not calling any of the nurses or doctors in Dallas to go up and testify and say where the wounds were and what the condition of the body was when they examined it, for example. This narrowed it down to fewer doctors that they could absolutely control that they could put on the stand. And they could easily be intimidated. Some of them were quiet then, and they've begun to speak out now and say, this is not possible. What, in your best guess, is the scenario that happened? Who actually shot JFK, and who actually was behind it? Basically, you go back to the politics of that day, and, and John Kennedy was doing things in Cuba that had angered organized crime uh, to the extent that uh, he had made promises that they'd have... Uh, the Cubans would have Havana back, which meant the casinos would open back up, prostitution would flourish, the Las Vegas off the coast of Florida would be blossoming again, and narcotics traffic would have its easy flow, and, and uh, the, the good times would be back. He reneged on that promise. 
he reneged at the Bay of Pigs and alienated the Cuban exiles to the point of bitter hatred. You read books like Peter Wyden's Bay of Pigs and, and you see that they say if they'd had a gun and could have gotten to him, they'd have killed him that day, that the air support didn't come in uh, at the uh, Pigs Bay invasion. So uh, you see that little group and you see that they have already got in operation an assassination apparatus. Uh, they have documented eight attempts on Fidel Castro from this CIA uh, group. Uh, Fidel Castro says there's 24, I think. And it's uh, curious that it only took one attempt for the President of the United it States. It only took one. They, they so couldn't. you wonder how serious these attempts really were. But uh, you, uh, you take that grouping right there, and when John Kennedy reneged on everything that he said after the missile crisis, uh, and uh, he promised that, uh, uh, Khrushchev that there would be never be an invasion of Cuba right. if they'd pull those uh, offensive missiles out. Then uh, the handwriting, I think, was on the wall at that time. And there was vengefulness involved, there was uh, money involved, there was power, and uh, that turned a, an apparatus that it was already trained and in in operation uh, and turned it to, uh, to Dallas. And I think you've got to remember that um, we don't protect or didn't protect our president at that time like Fidel Castro was protected mm. yes. or like uh, Charles de Gaulle was protected. Yes. And uh, it was, you know, it was a turkey shoot in Dallas. Yeah, the, the, the attempts on Fidel's life were certainly serious, but you had a different uh, uh, operational problem, if you will, to try to do it in Cuba where you did not have a broad consensus of it's okay to kill the man that you had in Dallas, that you had in the United States against Kennedy at that time. So they were having to plan a truly uh, clandestine assassination in which the, the shooter uh, wouldn't have some kind of magic immunity in a Warren Commission and whatnot there would be an extremely vigilant reaction from Fidel's bodyguard and the Cuban government and whatnot. So they were trying to think of esoteric, clever, tricky ways to do it. In Dallas, God knows they could set up a big, broad ambush right in <laughs> broad daylight and gun the man down. You have the, the killing apparently engineered by a, a paramilitary team, an ambush. Perhaps a small bunch of people with a few supporters in New Orleans and Dallas actually engineered the hit. Others knowing about it, but the cover-up uh, brings a lot of other very powerful and big groups into the, the, the conspiracy. And so then you get into motive. You know, why would the CIA be down on Kennedy enough to want to kill him? And you had, as Gary said, the Bay of Pigs, which they considered to be a betrayal. Objective readers in history would not necessarily agree, but they certainly did. And also, he was in the policy of reformulating uh, the, the policies in Cuba uh, to actually withdraw and cut back and curtail the assassination attempts on Fidel and break up the O.P. Mongoose infrastructure that was raiding and attacking in Cuba. You get this in the Betrayal book by Bob Morrow, for example. Then you have the right-wing military that, that you see, the, you know, why did the military suppress the evidence and doctor the photographs and control the doctors? Uh, their anger could easily have been because, you know, a liberal president uh, pulling them back from with Vietnam, which was designated as their next big war. So the right-wing military, very angry about his, his position towards the world and towards war and towards their choice of wars. Again, the mob, uh, the Kennedy brothers were waging, especially Bobby, but with Jack's support, were waging a major vendetta against mob leaders. They had put Hoffa in jail. They had kicked Marcello out of the country, and then Rosselli and Giancani were incorporated into the activities. The mob had a fight for survival on its hands with the Kennedys. And, and uh, then, of course, you have their huge investment in Cuba, and then you also have linkage into Southeast Asia. Traficanti had been to visit Vietnam. They were obviously planning a shift in resources or, or the go to the Golden Triangle. If the U.S. went in in a big way, you'd have lots of vehicles, airplanes, and ships, literally, that you could piggyback the drugs back into the States, and Kennedy's pulling out of Southeast Asia. The, the Texas, the right-wing business folks, of course, the oil depletion allowances. Kennedy was cutting them. They had become fabulously rich from these things, and they didn't want them cut. Uh, and then you get, of course, the key uh, is the FBI. 
not necessarily in the planning of the killing or the execution of the killing, but certainly Hoover's position, immediate position in the cover-up was essential to make it work. All his agents trying to construct or ordered to try to construct evidence that would pinpoint a lone assassin. Some of them came up with bits and pieces that were quite contradictory, which the Warren Commission pretty much just ignored. So where did the FBI come up with its big grievance against Kennedy? And this is where you get into, for example, Contract on America, uh, David Scheim's book. Uh, Hoover had, and also this other excellent book, we have a copy here, Secrecy and Power, The Life of J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover had a lifetime association with organized crime. He bet and gambled, you know, weekly. It was his big passion, and he took two vacations a year regularly uh, where the bills were picked up by people who related to, to organized crime. And he maintained throughout that uh, that organized crime was not a problem, not a factor in our society. It didn't exist. Didn't exist. Mm -hmm. No, the mafia didn't exist. The mafia, the mafia didn't, exist. didn't exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so he he's in a position, if you know, from that position and that history and that involvement, mm -hmm. his relationship with the mob, and then of course his his hard right wing stance, period, across the board. What you had all of these people faced with a very dynamic, effective, liberal president uh, who promised to be in office for four years and then four more years quite possibly followed by his brother for four years and maybe four more years and God knows Teddy after that I mean <laughs> they could see a real dyna dynasty uh, moving all the polls were showing that they had no chance whatsoever to win in the electoral process and this is the reasoning where people come up and say it was a coup d'etat this right-wing shadow government faced with, you know, each one with their, each element with their grievance against Kennedy, and this bottom underlying agreement that, that he was uh, a liberal, you know, doing everything wrong from their view of the world, uh, wanting to get rid of him. They couldn't wait for an election. They wouldn't win an election anyway. So the only way they could defend their interests would be to eliminate him. Thereby, uh, at the same time, establishing very clearly to subsequent presidents and senators and congresspeople about who really controls the power in this country and what the bottom line is when you start taking positions that could damage their interests. Well, we've talked about the conspiracy on our next program. We're going to talk about the cover-up and also some of the new books that have come out recently with John Stockwell and Gary Shaw will be with us. Can't wait for that one either. So stay with us for our next program. That brings us to the end of this Alternative Views. Gary Shaw has established the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas. It's a repository of a lot of information concerning the assassinations available to the public. It has films, newsreels, audio and visual tapes, artifacts, government documents, books, and publications. They're available to you in the center's files. It's a 3,000 square foot area which includes a public exhibit where evidence and information concerning the assassinations are on display. You can also see a 20 minute film of the assassination and its controversies. If you'd like a copy of this brochure which you've been looking at on your screen, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to JFK Assassination Information Center West End Marketplace, Suite 310, 603 Munger Avenue, Dallas, Texas, 75202. The phone number is 214-871-2770. That's the JFK Assassination Information Center, West End Marketplace, Suite 310, 603 Munger Avenue, Dallas, Texas, 75202. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Bye.